Hello. Hello, hello. <laughs> what I want to do is spend a little time on Laudato Si and Fratelli Tutti. Um, Laudato Si. What language is that? Italian, right. Italian. And what is the title of Laudato Si? What's it? The Canticle of Creatures, right. So Pope Francis took the Italian name of the Canticle of Creatures for the title for his document here. And of course the title itself is taken from St. Francis. Not just in, in the encyclical, but the title itself. Which is a cue of what this encyclical is going to be about. And as I mentioned earlier, mission, protect our fragile world, and that's Laudato Si. But before looking at that text of Laudato Si, I want to look at, the, I mean, the text of the um, encyclical of Laudato Si. Let's look at Laudato Si itself, okay? Uh, some of you, I'm presuming, would know this. At least I certainly hope so. Uh, some may not know it. But this is Francis' song, his poem, his prayer near the end of his life, and actually when he was blind. And he's praising all the beauty of creation in his blindness, which is astounding. Okay, and so what we have here is this beautiful poem, and I'm going to walk through it just so you have a context, because without this, we don't know where Pope Francis is coming from in that encyclical. So he publishes uh, basically the entire, not totally, but basically the entire Canticle of Creatures in the text of the encyclical. And as far as, I, from what I've read, that's the first time in the history of the Church a Pope has quoted Laudato Si in its entirety in a papal document. Again, somewhat significant. Which means Franciscan vision is being incorporated into the magisterium of the Church. So this is not just a passing fad here, this goes into the magisterium of the tradition of the Church. So, notice, I'm just going to walk through that real quickly with you. Most High, we've heard before, haven't we, when he was starting Most High and gl Glorious God? Here he is 20-some years later, and how is he addressing God? Most High. So Most High, all-powerful, good Lord. And then we hit the theme of what this is all about. Yours are the praises, the glory, and the honor, and all blessing. Yours are the praises, the glory, the honor, all blessing. To you alone, Most High, do they belong. That is, namely, praises, glory, and honor. And no human is worthy to mention your name. The God is so high above us, and all praise and glory is due to him. However, he goes on and praises anyway. So he starts out this very first line, Praise be you, my Lord, with all your creatures. We don't praise God alone. We can only praise God with all of what God has given us with all creatures. So that is really saying, to praise God, we've got to be connected to all his creatures, or we're not really praising God. We're praising ourselves, if it's just us. So, and then he goes on and he mentions creatures. Sir, brother, son, you give us light, beautiful, radiant, with great splendor, bears a likeness of you most high. And notice that he's addressing brother son as bearing a likeness of God, as a sacrament, as a sign of the very life of God. Think about that. He sees the son as the image of God, and God revealing God's self in that light of the son, who is the day through whom you give us light. And he is beautiful and radiant with great splendor, bears a likeness of you, most high one. And then he goes, Sister Moon and the stars. Huh. In heaven you form them, clear and precious and beautiful. So, <coughs> in these first two, Brother Sun, Sister Moon and the stars, it's, it's with all the whole cosmos, with all the heavens. He wouldn't have known about that recent telescope that let us see, what, a good number of years, light years away, you know. Um, the whole cosmos, the sun, 
the uh, moon and the stars and the stars out there whew, are infinite practically. So we praise God with all his creatures, which means with the cosmos itself, what is in the heavens. He makes that explicit. And notice how he even is sensitive. Um, sister moon and brother sun. Notice the adjectives he used for brother sun. Beautiful, radiant, great splendor. Sister moon, clear, precious, and beautiful. Even the adjectives that he uses to describe the sun and the moon are masculine and feminine. So there's a sensitivity here, basically, even in uh, looking at the heavens and all creatures, a sensitivity to the different natures. And he's experienced some as masculine, some as feminine which comes out in the adjectives there. And then he goes on, then he's going to address uh, wind, whom you give every kind of weather, give sustenance to your creature without air. Air is our sustenance. We cannot sustain ourselves. You give sustenance to your creatures. Water, useful, humble, precious, and chaste. Very beautiful way he describes water. So we have wind, water, and fire, whom you light through the night, brother fire, beautiful, playful, robust, and strong, brother, sister mother earth, who sustains governess, and who produces various fruit with colored flowers and herbs, who sustains us and produces the various fruits with colored, all that nourishes us, sister mother earth. And so it's, it alternates brother, sister, brother, sister, in the way he's doing this. And those four elements, beginning with, with the wind, um, the, the wind, the water, the fire, and the earth, in the medieval mind, those were the four basic elements of what exists. Francis didn't know about DNA and molecules, and I don't know much about that either. But nevertheless, with these different elements chosen, he's... he's through that, through the very structure of all that is, is somehow composed in the medieval mind of those four elements, the four basic elements. And those four basic elements of creation itself, that means all of, all of creation. The cosmos and all that, is, all that is created. Praise be you, my Lord. And it's with all of them that we praise God. In other words, we gotta be re rooted and in creation itself, in appreciating that and caring for that, if we're truly going to be praised, be you, my Lord. Um, so then he adds sister bodily death. Death is a part of being a creature. Creatures are not infinite. Creatures have beginning and end. Huh? So death is part of what it is to be a creature. So therefore, we praise the Lord through sister death itself. Because the second death then can do us no harm. Which, what means a second death? That means that mort our mortality, our second death, presuming we've already died to ourselves, that we've gone beyond ourselves. Therefore, if we've died to ourselves, because we've gone beyond ourselves, sister death can do us no harm. And blessed are those whom death will find in your most holy will. We talked about that a lot this morning in Francis's prayer. So it comes out again here in this canticle of your most holy will. That I may carry out your holy and true command. You know, from the beginning here in your most holy will. Praise and bless my Lord and give him thanks. Um, and serve him with great humility. What am I missing here? Whoops, there it is. After the four elements, which all of reality, I skipped over the most important one, those who give pardon for your love and bear infirmity and tribulation and those blessed are those who endure in peace. We know what Francis says about pardon. If we cannot forgive, make us forgive. Make us forgive so that we truly can be forgiven. So here again, those who grant pardon for your love, not just for myself, and bear infirmity and tribulation and enduring in peace. 
maintaining peace, because that is the gospel message, even if we are suffering, endure in peace. So all of this Pope Francis uses to call us, to call the church, um, to praise God, basically, with all creatures. And then he goes in, what does that mean concretely, practically, given the actual situation we're in? We have to start with that reality. Start, look at exactly what the situation is as best we can see and discern. And it's in that context out of which we begin that discernment. So I just wanted to mention this whole canticle, Laudato Si, so you know where the title comes from and what's behind the title is that whole wonderful canticle. There's some really wonderful literature on, on the canticle of creatures, which I wouldn't go into here with this for our purposes this evening. But what this in Laudato Si done is another example where Pope Francis hold up, holds up St. Francis as exemplar and teacher and explicitly incorporates his canticle into the church. Now let me just draw some practical points that for my read of the encyclical I think are important. Next one. Do we have a next one? No? Okay. Pope Francis writes again, I thought we put that up there, I guess I didn't, a text. He explicitly mentions St. Francis. He's giving credit to where his inspiration comes from. He, and Pope Francis writes, St. Francis of Assisi reminds us that our common home is like a sister with whom we share our life and a beautiful mother who opens her arms to embrace you, embrace us. Praise be you, my Lord, through our sister Mother Earth, who sustains and governs us and who produces various fruit with colored flowers. That's beautiful the way he writes. Remind our common home, which is the earth. He uses that expression. It's our common home, a home we share. Is like a sister with whom we share our life in a beautiful mother. Beautiful insight. But then he goes to the reality, and he adds, this sister, Mother Earth, now cries out to us because of the harm we inflict on her by our irresponsible use and abuse of the goods with which God has empowered her. The Earth now cries out to us. Why? Because we've come to see ourselves as her lords and masters entitled to plunder at will. So the violence present in our hearts, wounded by sin, is reflected in the symptoms of sickness evident in the soil, the water, the air, and in all forms of life. He's making the connection. The violence present in our hearts, wounded by sin, is reflected in these symptoms which cause which, which the earth is suffering. And he's He's really blunt. That's why the earth herself, burdened and laid waste, is among the most abandoned and mistreated of our poor. We have forgotten that we ourselves are dust of the earth, and our very bodies are made up of her elements. We breathe her air, we receive life, refreshment from our waters. So, I believe that St. Francis is the example par excellence for the vulnerable of an vulnerability and of an integral ecology lived out joyfully. Just as happens when we fall in love with someone, wherever he would gaze at the sun, the moon, or the smallest of animals, he burst into song. He communed with all creation and even preaching to the flowers, inviting them to praise the Lord. And he mentioned that's why Francis felt called to care for all that exists. Franciscan mission is to care for the fragile earth and for all, all peoples. This mission is primarily a mission of brother and sisterly love. He quotes again, for this reason St. Francis felt called to care. And he says, to foster bonds of affection is a form of contemplation. Listen to that. To foster 
bonds of affection for the earth, for all God's creatures, is a form of contemplation to see deeper into the reality of the other upon which we gaze. He even quotes St. Bonaventure, Pope Francis, and he quotes Bonaventure by saying, from a reflection of the primary source of all things, he would call creatures no matter how small by the name of brother or sister. That's St. Bonaventure talking. From a reflection on the primary source of all things. And the source of all things are reflected in what God has done. Abusing that is abusing the very source and the generosity that provided them for us. Truly offensive against God. So the Pope is saying here, the whole church needs Franciscan spirituality of brotherhood and sisterhood, and he indicates the Franciscan charism is urgent, not nice, kind of nice, you know, kind of beautiful, whole hum, bird baths and everything. No, he says, it's urgent. And then he's, he quotes the, the canticle again that we just quoted. Praise be you, my Lord, through Sister Water, who's very useful, humble, precious, and chaste. And then the Pope's a realist. One particularly serious problem is the quality of water available to the poor. Every day, unsafe water results in many deaths and the spread of water-related diseases. That's true happening right as we speak. Results in many deaths, unsafe water. I know I've been in Africa myself a number of times. I've seen it. And praise be you, Lord, through our sister Earth that produces flowers and herbs. And again, Pope says yes. But each year sees the disappearance of thousands of plant and animal species which we will never know, which our children will never see because they've been lost forever. And because of us, thousands of species will no longer give glory to God by their very existence, nor convey their message to us. That's heavy. And he ad 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 admits, he says, generally most of us are not too in interested in what does immediately affect us but remaining blind to the needs and reality around us will suffocate us. Which means he's saying we need to know what's going on. We need to be informed or we got willful ignorance. And then we can't contribute a thing. So, and he cites, you know, it's, there are a number of reasons for this little awareness. And he goes on about the so little awareness among us. And he says, due in partly, not totally, but in partly to the fact that many professionals, opinion makers, communications media, centers of power, are located in affluent urban areas far removed from the poor, so they don't know what the hell is going on. And they don't want to know. Which means we don't know, even if we want to. And he, especially true as climate change affects the livelihood of the poor. When I was in Africa uh, visiting uh, the friars in Lusaka, uh, which is um, that college that we were talked about, there was tension in the air because the rains didn't come when scheduled. And you could just feel the tension in the air. What's this mean? They don't come. Most of these people die, uh, are forced to leave their homes. I mean, you know what that causes, great uncertainty. So you could, you could kind of feel that in the air. Uh, there, there was some tension, even among the one, of, one friar from my province who's still there, spent 50 years in Zambia. Uh, even he was, was concerned when they didn't come. But before I left, they did come. And so there was a great, great relief. But they're concerned. So, and the Pope laments that given these many problems, he says, without appropriate international structures effective to address them, 
The Pope calls all of us, especially Franciscans, to ponder, engage, embrace, and promote this. The magnificent expression, the hymn of St. Francis that we just read. And we know the candle creatures we just looked at, it's based in the biblical tradition. The earth is the Lord's, Psalm 24. To him belongs the earth with all that's within it, Deuteronomy. The land shall not be sold in perpetuity, for the land is mine, and you are strangers and sojourners with me. Jesus asked about the sparrow sold for two pennies. So he concludes this letter of Laudato Si, basically making two points. He calls for what is a new term, ecological conversion. I've heard of the call to the conversion. He's calling for an ecological conversion. That is, we work as cooperator with God in the work of creation. And if not, we provoke a rebellion on the part of nature. And basically he says, and as this canticle concludes, Praise be you, my Lord, through all who give pardon for your love. Blessed are those who endure in peace. He repeats again, there's an interconnection between natural systems, harmony with the earth, and social systems, harmony among peoples. And among peoples, forgiveness is the key to each and every relationship. Because only in mutual forgiveness is there peace, not in the buildup of more and more arms, which is happening horrendously as we speak, all over the world. So, what is new in this encyclical where he talks about an ec ecological conversion, he says that means part of that is an integral ecology that sees the connection between poisoned human relationships and our relationships with nature. He defines integral ec ecclesial ecology in this way. Integral eco ecology, he says, seeks comprehensive solutions which consider the interactions with natural systems themselves and with our social systems. The natural systems themselves with our social systems. We're faced not with two separate crises, but one environmental and the other, and the other social, but rather with one complex crisis. You can't separate those. So he says, and I'm quoting him, strategies for solution demand an integrated approaches, approach to combating poverty, restoring dignity to the excluded, and at the same time, promoting nature. So for this notion of integral ecology, that connection, Francis writes that all of us, and he writes this letter to every human being on the planet, not to Catholics, to every human being on the planet. He writes, all we need is ecological conversion, whereby the effects of our encounter with Jesus become evident in our relationship with those around us and with the world. And he says, as he concludes this, in terms of a missionary context, is to be protectors of God's handiwork. And he says that's essential to a life of virtue especially for Franciscans who are to show the way from small ways to big ways. And he says, recalling the words in life of St. Francis, we come to realize that a healthy relationship with creation is fundamental dimension of overall personal conversion, which entails a recognition of our errors, faults, failures, that hopefully leads to repentance and desire to change. Pretty strong stuff. And who else in the world is looking this, looking this in the eye and proclaiming it? I know of no other leader on the planet that does what he does. And he's not afraid of it. And he's criticized. He doesn't care. He's calling to the way he sees it. God love him for that. But he concludes this encyclical here with a prayer, two prayers, one for Christians and one for those who are not Christians. And I want to conclude with the one he wrote for those who are non-Christians. It's, it's beautiful and I think captures even a little better what's in the encyclical. The next one, the prayer. Oh, I didn't, I thought it was, I saw Laudatia, I got confused, sorry. 
Let's pray this together. Why don't you stand up and let's pray this together. Stand up, everyone. Let's just take a moment first. Let's pray. God of love, show us our place in this world as channels of your love for all the creatures of this earth. For not one day is forgotten in your sight. And I those who possess power and money, that they may avoid the sin of indifference, that they may have the common good, that they may be and care for this world in which we live. The poor and the earth are crying out. O Lord, seize us with your power and light. Help us to protect all life. For a better future, for the coming of your kingdom, justice, peace, love, and beauty. Praise be to you. Amen. Okay, I'll look at Fratelli Tutti with you. At least how much time do I have? Okay. This is about human fraternity. And again, he takes the title from St. Francis. And this is, are the first two words of Admonition 7, in which Francis writes a series of admonitions to the friars. Actually, those admonitions at least some scholars are saying Francis wrote to fill in the holes of the Rule 1223. Because that was a papal document and not everything got in there that he wanted. So admonitions address some of those issues. So admonition 7, it calls the brothers to keep their eye on the Good Shepherd to, to, uh, to care for the flock. And he's saying that all the brothers, whoops, all the brothers are to do that. And so he takes that title from Admonition 7 as capturing what he wants to do. He's already talked about care for fragile earth, now the care for human family. Because that has to be addressed too to address the other one. So he had to complete what he started in the Dato scene to address human relationships. And he calls this basically on... Um, was the word uh, social friendship, brotherhood and social friendship. So now he's setting about how do we repair our human fraternity across the globe? Like Francis who crossed the lines to meet with the Sultan of Egypt, who was the enemy of all of Western Christianity, and Francis against the opposition of the whole of Europe, including the general, the cardinal, who was the general leading the Christian army uh, to attack the Saracens in Egypt, Francis went there to try to stop that and to announce peace. And so he gets there, and of course the cardinal there is not very happy when he shows up. And was get, he, he was Get, Francis was getting nowhere with him, so he asked, he wanted to go see the Sultan, which is going across enemy lines, you know, pretty complicated even in those years. Um, anyhow, they worked that out. And uh, so at a time of violence, power struggles for influence, that's what we're all about, influence, St. Francis opened his heart to his brother, the Sultan of Egypt. And so basically, Pope Francis refers to that example as he calls us to do the, to value fraternity and friendship across all boundaries, distances, and divisions. And actually the beginnings of this text began not in Rome, but in Abu Dhabi, the United Emirates. That's where this text was actually born, in Abu Dhabi when Pope Francis was visiting the Grand Imam. Now, I don't know the status of that Imam. I can't pronounce his name, Amma al Tayyabeb. They met together far away from Rome, not in a Christian context at all. 
And together, he and the imam produced a document called Human Fraternity for World Peace. And they wrote this document in 1219, and I was not aware of it until some of the friars at our retreat center said, we have to do something on this document, Human Fraternity. Human fraternity. I said, well, what's that? Because I wasn't aware. And then I learned about Abu Dhabi, what happened there. And basically, <coughs> they write a document <coughs> in which they proclaim the Muslims of the East and the West, together with the Catholic Church and the Catholics of the East and West, declare the adoption of a culture of dialogue as the path, mutual cooperation as the code of conduct, reciprocal understanding as the method and the standard. And they send that to all persons of goodwill. But then, in this context, this context explains what he goes into a culture of dialogue. And I think these, these next two slides get to the heart of Abu Dhabi, um, written together with the Imam. And the the authentic teaching of religions, so he's speaking not as a Christian here, but of religions, invite us to remain rooted in the values of peace, to defend the values of mutual understanding, human fraternity, and harmonious coexistence. He says, every religion teaches that. So to reestablish wisdom, justice, and love, and to reawaken religious awareness among young people so that future generations may be protected from the realm of materialistic thinking and from dangerous policies of unbridled greed and indifference that are based on the law of force and not on the force of law. That text captures basically the heart of the message, I believe. And in these same um, lines, he refers to Pope Francis, I mean Pope, uh, Pope St. Francis, when he's speaking here about, uh, about Fratelli Tutti. Notice what he's saying from the thematic of Abu Dhabi. He writes, the saint of fraternal love, simplicity and joy, who inspired me to write the encyclical Laudato Si, prompts me once more to devote this new encyclical to fraternity and social friendship. Francis felt himself a brother to the sun, the sea, and the wind, yet he knew he was even closer to those of his own flesh. The sea and the wind, even closer to his own flesh. That's in the opening lines of Fratelli Tutti. And I said, as inspired, from that meeting with the Imam in Abu Dhabi. So, Francis himself felt that. And he admits that Francis inspired him for Laudato Si, and this same saint of fraternal love inspires him for Fratelli Tutti. So he's taking those two dimensions of, uh, of Francis. And he talks about that in Fratelli Tutti. He talks about his visit in, with uh, Francis with the Sultan in Egypt. Francis continues, Pope Francis, we are impressed, he writes, that some 800 years ago, St. Francis urged that all forms of hostility or conflict be avoided and that a humble and fraternal subjection be shown to those who did not share his faith. No wonder that when the Pope signed this document, you, you know where he signed it, right? Where it became official, teaching. Once he put his signature to it, do you know where he did that? At the tomb of St. Francis. Hmm? Tomb of St. Francis. He went all the way to Assisi, down into the crypt of the Basilica, where St. Francis is buried, and there he had a simple mass with just a few people, and at that time, on that altar, the text was placed there, and he officially signed for Tutti. How much closer and how much more dramatic and clear 
cannot be what he's trying to get across to us. They're right connecting with Francis right here. That's what he means. Today, in today's reality, not birdbath St. Francis, in today's reality, that is the Francis that we are called to be, let, lead us, guide us as we deal with our own world today. So that is that's, that's overwhelming. And Francis, in Francis' writings, we find the same thing. Francis admonishes his brothers in this way. For love of him, the brothers must make themselves vulnerable to their enemies, both visible and invisible, because the Lord says, whoever loses his life because of me will save it. Holding on to power and prestige are not the way to sow peace. And we know how St. Francis wrote uh, in the earlier, or at least I say Francis and his brothers, about their mission to Muslims in the earlier rule. Listen to what he says. We have that slide there? Yeah, great. This captures exactly what Pope Francis is doing. As for the brothers who go, they can live spiritually among the Saracens. That's a medieval term in, uh, in Latin or in Italian. For, for Muslims and non-believers in two ways. One way is not to engage in arguments or disputes, but rather to be subject to every human creature for God's sake. To go and be subject. That's in a humble heart. Not better than, above than. Be subject. And to acknowledge they're Christians. The other way is to announce the word of God when he sees that it might please God. But the first step in any mission to serve the human race is to be subject to the other. We talk about humility. It's not poor me. It's actually in a relationship to be humble, to be subject to. That opens the heart. So they're not to go to the Saracens as though they were better than them, but they're to live among them and learn from them. There was mother, she support was, she, God love her, she died a few years ago. It's mother Veronica, she was French Algerian, and she was called, she was a poor Claire nun in Algeria. She was French, actually French speaking, French nationality. But she joined the Claires in Algeria. And then she got a call, and she was abbess there. She got a call from the Congregation of Religious asking her to go to Lusaka in Zambia to become the abbess there because that, that, that community was in trouble. It was founded by American nuns, but they weren't able to connect well in the whole context of African culture, and it wasn't working. So she ups and goes on one condition, though, that she had at least a year or maybe more simply to be exclaustrated and to live in a village with other women. And she did that for a year and a half. What? To be subject to them? To learn. And what she learned in that experience of concrete going to the Africa, not to tell them how to do things and run a monastery, but first learn what it is simply to be subject to them. And she was Incredibly successful, and that monastery flourishes today after she's gone. So what Pope Francis is doing here is basically affirming a global vision of human fraternity. A global vision of human fraternity. We don't set up limits. And so the fraternity of our Franciscan life is not just to be contained among the brothers and sisters within our specific religious community. Yes, but it's not only that. And Pope Francis caught that. I sometimes tell my Franciscan brothers, maybe I'm being a little protective here, I don't know, but I like to need a bit. I said, you know, our specific provinces of friaries or friaries or orders are not meant to be our prisons. <laughs> They're meant to send us out, as that is discerned. 
Fraternity is our life, but it's only our life if fraternity is our mission. So that's why Pope then, when he takes a look at Fratelli Tutti, he writes, my desire is that the seed of Francis planted may grow in the hearts of many. My desire, the seed of St. Francis that's planted in our hearts, might grow in the hearts of many. And he says this in the context of a global vision of the human family. So this is all in terms of the initial part where he's setting forth his, uh, his vision. And again, at least four times he's referring to St. Francis. And he's, when he reflects on that, he sees, he's very concerned. He writes, he sees clouds over a closed world. One group dominates over another or tries to dominate over another. Political systems regress and what grows is profit-based economic powers that continue to exploit Mother Earth. Culture of indifference affects the unborn, the disabled, the elderly. Pervasive social violence spreads to the economy, politics, and media. Precious resources are wasted expandingly on more powerful arms ordered toward the total destruction of life and property. He indicates this reality is somewhat overwhelming. But Pope Francis sees hope through consciously, intentionally fostering broader global fraternity and social friendships. And so St. Francis concurs. He encourages his brothers, I quote, not to quarrel among themselves or with others, but strive to respond humbly, I am a useless servant. Because only humility can build a fraternity. And then he asks the questions, we have to decide whether we're going to be the good Samaritan or an innocent by, didn't different bystand. Or does he encourage us to open ourselves to the world that love grows beyond family and nation to include strangers and all people into a friendship worth where every person is recognized. So he concludes that by saying all human connections are to be consciously cultivated. And he includes in that fraternity includes the universal destination of all goods because God creation belongs to all of us. Which reminds us of admonition five. Nothing belongs to you. You cannot boast in none of the things you have. Possessions close us up in a small world. So he calls for engagement of an open world, cultural exchanges, new cultures brought by immigrants, embracing them. But he speaks of a fraternal gratuitousness, which includes concern for other nations. And so he says, we need to pay attention to the global to avoid narrowness and to look to the local to keep our feet on the ground. So he speaks of the global fraternity and the local fraternity. On every relationship, he urges one thing against pettiness and resentment of useless infighting and constant confrontation. All that does is separate us. So he looks for a better kind of politics, which is truly at the service of the common good. And he says, avoid policies that foster greater individualism, increased freedom for the powerful at the expense of the powerless. And the United Nations needs teeth so the family of nations can acquire real change. And greater fraternity is acquired and when we uphold high principles and think of the long-term common good of all of us on the planet. So the last three chapters, he goes into what is a culture of encounter. It's the opposite of feverish exchange of opinions or monologues. Such increases um, on misunderstandings. So he's just looks at the reality, and then he refers to Francis and comes back. And what he's saying in this one section towards the end, St. Francis is quoted, comes in again. St. Francis told his friars, 
whoever comes to them, friend or foe, thief or robber, let him be received with kindness. Whoever, let him be received with kindness. That's mercy. And that's universal fraternity. I remember being struck when Pope Francis went to Israel and he took along with him a, a Jewish rabbi. I don't know if you remember that or not. Like when he went to, to um, Congo, he took the Archbishop of Canterbury and the President of the Church of Scotland. So he's setting an example here by when he does what he does and how he does it. When he, when he first went to Israel, the Jewish rabbi accompanied him on the plane back. He was asked uh, by a reporter, that's when he really speaks bluntly, you know, when he's on a plane speaking to reporters, there he's free, you know. And so he asked, uh, how is it, Your Holiness, that you brought a Jewish rabbi with you on this trip? And Pope said, don't you have any friends? <laughs> That's all he said. That was his response. Don't you have any friends? That captures a lot. Um, And so when we talked about this in, uh, I think it was in Sarawak, yeah, one of the sisters asked, uh, or Derek, correct me, Derek, sisters asked, she said, okay, that's wonderful, but what can we do concretely? You know, something very concrete that we can do. I said, start inviting people you don't know to dinner. That'll start. That's the start. And then our friaries are beginning to do that more and more. Um, We've always tried to invite to dinner diocesan priests in the area uh, as a ministry to them, but also expanding that more. Where they, the fire, they, they have a nice big soup kitchen, they eat with them in the soup kitchen at least twice a week. In, in other words, rub shoulders. I once took a group of my students to where the Little Sisters of the Poor, St. Mother Teresa's um, sisters, and they have in St. Louis, in a very poor area, they have a soup kitchen there. And um, so I made the arrangements, and they were in my class. And uh, I took them. They were all prepared to get in the kitchen, roll up their sleeves, you know. No, you get in line with these people and go in and have lunch. <laughs> That's what you do. That's why we're here. And, um, well, they were somewhat taken. Really? Yeah. You know, so I said, you young ladies, sit with the ladies over there, and you guys go over here with these men. And... Um, Wow, that really touched them. And then also, you know, I have to tell you this story because uh, it was a little bit of a risk, but I did it anyway. It was in a class, and um, these were seniors, they're older undergrads. And in the North St. Louis, there are just a lot of prostitutes on the street. And some kid said, um, was making some comment about it in a very negative way. And asked me what I thought. I said, I don't know. I said, you know, let's invite a couple to class and we can ask them. <laughs> and we did. And they came. Well, they won't forget that class. And neither will those ladies who came. Huh. What it was, it was human connection. And that's what I think the Pope is telling us. And I also tell the first, human connection, if you're going to have global fraternity, you know, guys, you've got to learn another language. Because if you don't learn another language, you're always one step apart. You know what they call someone who speaks three languages? What do you call someone? Trilingual? Bilingual? What's someone who speaks two languages? Or what? Bilingual, no? Someone who speaks only one language? An American. <laughs> That's unfortunately true. Unfortunately, to trying to change that among the friars. Now, my last comment, I'm going to a prayer, but I want to say what I said earlier. In 2020, Chris, the first Christmas after the publication of this, there was a letter written by the ministers general of the first order and the structure of the abbesses of the second order, and then in terms of secular order and third order, you know, numbers who had important positions in those, in those structures, they all wrote a letter together, uh, which was nice. They did that. They, that. That took some effort, you know. And 
it just jumped out of me when they said, basically, we have to read Fratelli Tutti through, Saint, through Pope Francis as coming directly from Francis himself to us today. That's a pretty strong statement. So when we ask questions about Franciscan spirituality, huh? We got it on a, on a plate in front of us, put right in front of our face. We need to take that if we're going to develop in Franciscan life. How do we impart this today in view of the realities that we as a global family have to deal with? So with that, let's conclude with the prayer that's the end of this together. Lord, Father of our human family, you created all human beings equal in dignity, put forth into our hearts a fraternal spirit, and inspire in us a dream of renewed encounter, dialogue, justice, and peace. Move us to create healthier societies and a more dignified world. A world without hunger, poverty, violence, and war. May our hearts be open to all people and nations of the earth. May we recognize the goodness and beauty that you have sown in each of us, and thus forge bonds of unity, common projects, and shared dreams. Amen. Thank you all very much. It's gotten late. I still made it by 9.30. Okay. <laughs> Just on time. <laughs> Thanks, Wayne. Um, firstly, we are beggars. So if you'd like to leave something for the use of the facilities and also a little stipend for, for the Wayne. Uh, Caroline has a bag. I think it's better, it's easier if we can, at the door as you exit, uh, if you'd like to drop something, um, a Caroline would be there at the door. Um, this is also an opportunity to introduce to you the Secular Franciscan Order. It's an order, it's not a social club. Um, and we've got four fraternities here. Can the seculars please put up your hands? Just wave. So wow. these are the Secular Franciscans. Um, so we have got quite a number of them. Uh, Janet is our national minister. And um, we also have a lot of friars here, so if those of you are thinking about a Franciscan vocation, friars, put up your hands! <laughs> and Gerald Tan over there with the curly woolly hair, he is the vocation promoter here for Singapore, and you've got a lot of students here in the friars. Um, feel free to speak to any one of us. Uh, poor Claire is our contemplative second order. You've heard of the Carmelite nuns. We have our own equivalent. Uh, that's the poor Claire's. So if you want to find out more, just also speak to the Friars. We've got FMDM sisters, our FMM sisters here as well. So just speak to us. If you're interested in joining any of our Franciscan family, just come and connect. So thank you for being here this evening. It's lovely to see you. And um, we'd like to thank also the Carmelites. Um, I, I saw Father Edward here just now. Um, so just thank the Carmelites and also thank the seculars for organizing this whole event. Shall we yes. give them a round of applause? Yes, wonderful. Thank you so much. And let's thank Father Wayne again. Yeah. So hope to see you tomorrow evening or tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning we'll be at St. Clair Hall at St. Mary of the Angels, 9.30. And we'll be touching on the Holy Spirit and the latest research in the Franciscan world. And an evening here will be on sacraments, uh, especially the Eucharist. See you tonight, uh, tomorrow and have a good night and have a good journey home. God bless.